Well, good morning, Grace Vineyard, and everybody watching on, on uh, YouTube. Nice to be here. Um, this morning, Mark and the trustees have asked me to give an update on the finances of the church, so where we stand. Um, so I'm going to do that. And, you know, this is part of our transformation series, and really a, a sort of co- continuation of the talk I gave on worship a few weeks ago. Because as Mark said earlier on, giving is part of our worship. So firstly, I'm going to present the trustees' report. And secondly, I'm going to look at uh, the joy of giving. Giving that pleases God. And that verse there is the key verse that's, that's noted up there. Okay. So firstly, I'm going to present the trustees' report. So first slide, please. So these are the trustees. Um, Mark's got much longer hair now than he has in that picture. <laughs> we need a new picture of him, really. Uh, but Mark's the chair of the trustees, and uh, Mark keeps us in line, basically. Um, Anne Hogan, who does the overheads for us, uh, it's a lovely picture of Anne there. Um, she does all the safeguarding matches. She deals with all the safeguarding. So, you know, if there's any dodgy dealings in our past as leaders, um, that is revealed on a CRB check take makes it sure that we as a church are, can be safe in what we do and there's no skeletons in our cupboard that are going to affect the integrity of the church. Ray Cross, uh, he leads the policy, leads on policy, and that's everything that we need to do legally. So policies on employment, policies on data protection, uh, data retention, so all your names and addresses, all your personal details are in church suite. That all has to be done under a, a legal policy, safeguarding, that we just said that Anne deals with. There's a policy on that for safeguarding children and vulnerable adults. And disciplinary pr- procedures, can't say it, disciplinary procedures, you know, if Mark does something dodgy, um, then, you know, we as a church need to have procedures in place so that everybody knows where we stand. Uh, and lastly, myself, and I look after the finances um, I haven't got a checkbook, you'll be pleased to know, so I can't take all the money myself. Um, but I do pay salaries, I pay invoices, I monitor what comes in and goes out, I work with our accountants um, to do our annual returns for Companies House and Charities Commission and get everything audited and make sure that everything's okay. So where are we financially and what have we done with the money that you've so generously given us? Well, I really mean that, you know, generous, because you are a generous church. Um, I see all the debits and credits uh, in the account and, and just so a big thank you from us as trustees and leaders for all that you give because it is very much appreciated. Um, so in this first slide gives you a, an idea of our income and expenditure. So total income for last financial year up to March was 62,000. Uh, outgoings were 64,000 so we spend a little bit more money than we're getting in. Um, but as you can see, the average balance there was just over 46,000. And legally, we need to keep three months of you know, what we expend um, in the bank. So what we need is 16,000, or needed last year was 16,000. So we've got plenty of money in the bank to cover anything, you know, if the, anything went wrong with the church. Um, we had no income at all. We've got money in the bank to pay for the debts that are going to come in, like rental of the hall, things like that. And then over the last six months, um, again, we're slightly over on expenditure to income, but again, we've got far more in reserve than we need in the bank. Um, Yeah, so that's that. Next slide. Um, You're not going to be able to read this, but this is just sort of a balance sheet of of what we spend each month and where it goes, uh, and then annually down the the right-hand side. So obviously, as you can expect, the biggest expenditure is salaries. Uh, we employ Jill and we employ Mark part-time, um, but they do far more for us as a church than we pay them for, and they do far more hours than we pay them for. Um, and Mark being part-time, he's got a, a part-time job with a company called Gallo, where he does a lot of setting up of film sets, and he worked a lot on the Olympics when that was around, um, and they do lots of staging and all sorts of stuff. Um, but obviously he can't then do stuff for us as a church. And I'm not saying that the pastors need to do it all, because we all get to play. But certainly it'd be great if at some point in the future we could employ Mark full-time. Uh, one bit of major expenditure that isn't on there, 
is the rental of this place. It says zero at the moment, because obviously last year we didn't come to church, so we didn't pay any money to rent this hall. Um, but it's £150 a week to rent this place. So that goes, that's over £7,000 a year that we have to expend. Um, no, I'm, I'm well done. I'm well done here. Oh, I see what I've done. Yeah. <laughs> My son printed this double side and it's confusing me. Um, so other expenditure, we're members of Vineyard Churches UK and Ireland. So we pay a subscription effectively to be part of the Vineyard movement. So that's like two and a half thousand pound a year. Um, we have accountants that deal with salaries, that deal with um, doing the returns for Companies House and Charity Commission and all that sort of stuff. They audit our accounts every year, so we have to pay them. That's three and a half thousand ish a year. Then we've got our website, internet, Zoom, CCLI license to uh, use the music that we do, all that sort of stuff. Uh, it's another couple of thousand pounds public liability insurance, and on and on and on. There's lots there. Um, now, next slide. This is the one I like the best. Uh, as you can see there, in the year up to March this year, we got nearly £9,000 back from the government in, in gift aid. And this year already, up until September, we got 4700 back. So that's a total in 18 months of £13,633 we've got back from the government in gift aid, which is brilliant. I told you we were a generous church, didn't I? Um, but that's only possible if you've filled in a gift aid declaration form so that we can get your tax back. So if you haven't got one, um, or you don't know if you've got one, then let me know and I'll see what I can do and sort it out so that we get that 20% back from the government on the tax that you pay on your income that you give to the church. Now, obviously, this is just a really basic overview uh, of our accounts. But if you want to know more, all you've got to do is go onto the internet, go onto the company's house website, type in Grace Vineyard Purley, and all our details will come up, and all our accounts are published there in full that have been audited and submitted and approved by company's house. And finally, a brief update on Grow Baby, which has continued throughout lockdown, and it's been the one outreach thing that we've really been doing all the way through. So during lockdown, 332 babies and children have been served, 10,000 items of clothing and equipment have been given away, and although Tuesday Grow Baby was closed during the height of lockdown, items could still be requested, and Mark drove all over the borough delivering buggies and clothes and all sorts during lockdown when they couldn't open. It's now fully open again, and all the way through, they followed all the COVID rules and they're still using masks and sanitizers. Um, donations of clothing and equipment continue to flood in. You know, Jill turns up on a Tuesday morning and there's bags and bags of stuff stuck outside the door. Some of it rubbish. Actually, quite a bit of it rubbish sometimes. Um, and that has to be sorted and taken to the dump and you know, horrible clothes got rid of or whatever. Um, but that needs to be done. Um, next slide. Uh, Grow Baby has been blessed financially again this year as well. Somebody from another church put us in for an award and we got £1,000 from the Arnold... Where's my note? Um, from the Arnold Clark Community Fund, which is brilliant. Um, we didn't even ask for it, she did it for us. Um, so with that money, we've been able to bless Montpelier Church because they let us use the church for free. And we've got two massive great rooms there full of stuff. Um, which they don't charge us for, so we bless them with that, and we bless them with some money to decorate the foyer so we can use that as a better place. Um, and we've also been able to purchase a number of lightweight buggies, which are always in demand, um, so they give away. And what's really great about Grow Baby is when mums have finished with it, they bring it back. And they do a similar thing at Sutton Vineyard, and they've had a double buggy that's been given back three times and been re-donated to another family, which is fantastic. Um, as was mentioned to say today, you know, Jill uh, and Rach do it. Um, they've, they've had some helpers that have stopped doing it, uh, and so they'd love it if some other people could join them on Grow Bay on a Tuesday morning. And as Jill always says, all the mums that come get prayed for, 
and they get to share Jesus with all the people that come, which is fantastic. So, giving that pleases God. So you've heard the trustees update. So are we joyful when we give? Why should we give and why do we give back to God? Now when I introduced my talk on worship a few weeks ago, and as Mark has stressed already, again, singing a musical worship is our own worship. One of the core values of this church and the vineyard movement is that life worship is a lifestyle. Yeah. A lifestyle loving God and loving Jesus. And out of that comes our song worship, serving others, and our giving. So today our reading is from 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 11, which includes the verse that I had on the slide there. I'll read it out. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That was verse 7. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Now I know when somebody stands up in church and says, I'm going to talk about giving, everyone gives a big groan. Because maybe you think you're going to be told off for not giving enough. Or it's a begging session for more money. But as I said earlier, you're a really, really generous church. So thank you. I'm not going to do that this morning. Now here at Grace Vineyard, uh, we believe that giving should be joyful. And this is reflected in our welcome pack, which is the next slide. Every welcome pack gets this little slip in it. And it says there, uh, we believe that the best model for all believers in giving is found in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, which was one of the verses we just read. In other words, each of us is to consider carefully how much we should give to the work of God. So the key phrase in our reading and in the handout and the welcome pack is, God loves a cheerful giver. Therefore, we aren't to treat giving as a duty, no matter how we feel. And why can I say that? Well, Paul says it, doesn't he? In that phrase, God loves a cheerful giver. It totally contradicts the assumption that giving is a duty. Yes, Paul says, each one of us must give, but how do we give? Each of you should give what you've decided to give in your hearts, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. So it's our decision how much we give, but that should come out of a heart of love for God and out of relationship with God and through the Holy Spirit, not out of compulsion or duty. You know, the tax man loves, or he doesn't care actually, how you feel when you pay your taxes, just that you pay them. He doesn't feel you're happy or sad about it, he just wants you to pay. But unlike the tax collector, God is more interested in the attitude of our heart as we give. Not how much or little, because God loves a cheerful giver. It's like the little boy who was sent to Sunday school with £1.50 to put in the collection. And when he was at Sunday school, they talked about this verse. So when he got home, he still had a pound in his pocket. And his mum said, I gave you £1.50 to put in the collection, so why have you still got a pound? He said, well, the man up the front said, God loves a cheerful giver, so I gave him 50p and kept the pound for myself. So how can we give cheerfully and generously? Well, Paul explains how through the remainder of the passage. Verse 8. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will, be, you will abound in every good work. Now, who supplies seed to the sower, bread and food, will also supply and increase your store of seed, enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. That takes us back to our study in Beatitudes a few months ago when we talked about hungering and thirsting for righteousness. It all comes out of a relationship with God. 
So we can be cheerful and generous because we know that God has already supplied all that we need. And I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel either. God isn't giving these things to us to hold on to for ourselves. He gives so that we can give to him and give to others and give generously and cheerfully. The dynamic of the kingdom has always been the more we give, the more God gives. And we've seen that as a church. Put it another way, we live with open hands, not a clenched fist. Deuteronomy 15, 7 to 10 says this. If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites, or Perleites, or Croydonites, or wherever you are, in any of the towns of the land that the Lord, the God, has given you, and we believe we're in Perley because God has put us here, so we need to deal with the poor in Perley. Rather be open-handed. Yeah, do not be, sorry, I missed that, uh, the land that God has given you. Do not be hard-hearted and tight-fisted towards them. Rather be open-handed. And freely lend them whatever they need. Give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. Now when I first read that uh, in, in verse 8 about lend them whatever they need, does that mean we want it back? Well, no, it doesn't. I know I said in Grow Baby, do, people do bring things back. But when I look this passage up, I realise it's related to the Jewish law of giving everything back, cancelling every debt in every seven years in a seven-year cycle. And then every 70 years there's a jubilee. And Ellicott's commentary, this is written in the 1800s, so it's a bit weird English. He said this, If he does not like to take it as a gift, grant it to him as a loan. That's how they worked in Israel. But everything went back to the original owner. And we're just giving back to God what's his anyway. Deuteronomy 15.11 goes on to say, there will always be poor people in the land. That's true, isn't it? There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore I command you, be open-handed towards your fellow Israelites, Perleites, Croydonites, Sutnites, who are poor and needy in your land. Rick Warren, the pastor of Saddleback, I don't know if he's retired now, he might have done, but pastor of Saddleback Church, the author of The Purpose Driven Life, you've seen that book? I know we've done it in church together. He said this, the only antidote to materialism is giving because materialism's all about getting. Every time I give, my heart grows bigger. Every time I give, I become more like Jesus. So rather than being tight-fisted like Gollum, our next picture. My precious. Let's be more like Scrooge at the end of the Muppet Christmas Carol. You know, at the beginning of, of the Muppet Christmas Carol, there's that scene. Here comes Mr. Skinflint, here, here comes Mr. Grimm. But at the end, I know it's, it's not a Christian thing, but, you know, he's turned into this person who wants to give stuff, give people, help people. He helps Tiny Tim. He's a generous person. And if we know Jesus and we know God, then we're generous people. So giving that pleases God does cost us. Of course it does. However, it's not the sacrifice that pleases God, but the position of our hearts in surrender and trust in him that we demonstrate that actually pleases God. And as I referred to in the talk on worship, John Wimber said this, show me where you spend your time, money and energy and I'll tell you what you worship. And finally, it's God who provides all we have in the first place, isn't it? Paul knows this to be true, which is why he says in verses 10 and 11, Now he supplies the seed for the sower, bread for food, and also supplies and increases your store of seed, will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way, so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've given. Thank you for the generosity of this church and all that we've been able to do in your kingdom and for your kingdom. Lord, help us to continue to give from a heart in tune with yours and be cheerful givers that will help your kingdom grow more and more. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So thank you for listening. Uh, we're now going to end the uh, YouTube session and move over to um, Zoom for those that are logging on. And if you've been listening and you'd like to join our Zoom session, then please email the church office uh, and we will give you a link for next week. Uh, and for us in the hall, we can have some questions. So what is your church background? And how has that influenced how you view giving? What obstacles to giving might you struggle with? How has this morning's talk challenged or changed your view of how we should give? And pray for each other for a deeper intimacy with Jesus so that we can be cheerful givers. Amen.